We're looking at two lights about 15 billion light years from Earth. Two separate celestial bodies. The reason why they look so bright from so far away is that they are very mysterious objects called a Kuazar. But that's not the point. These objects were first seen through a telescope in England in 1979. And scientists gave them different names. They called one QSO957 and the other QSO561. Then they continued to study them. There was something strange. These objects were a little too similar. In every sense, all the examinations revealed strange similarities. It's like, like they were the same. Too much like these two objects. In fact, the same. They had to be. It doesn't make any sense, but they are. And so it was for astronomers. It was like seeing a mirage in the desert. But one of them would eventually solve the problem. They were not wrong. They weren't wrong. What they saw as two separate objects was actually one single object. And one man had already predicted and theorized this 100 years earlier. The world's first famous scientist, a man who was treated like a superstar while he was alive, a phenomenon who taught many people how to think outside the box, Albert Einstein. At the beginning of the 20th century, the man who told us that humanity had misinterpreted the universe for thousands of years and that even geniuses like Isaac Newton could be wrong. In the What is Time video, we made an introduction to Einstein's universe and laid the groundwork. Now I would like to take a deeper look at the universe through Einstein's eyes and, of course, the theory of general relativity that changed everything. I think the word that best describes Einstein's universe is space-time, and what we call space is the 3D space place we know. In other words, we live in a universe with length, width, and height. As you may remember from the previous video, time was thought to be outside of this. Einstein's finding that changed everything was that he said that time is not independent of this space. In the universe, time and space are so intertwined and integrated that we can think of them as a fabric, like an entity on which all the objects in the universe move. We call this entity space-time. Isaac Newton described the universe as a stage, like a box, a box in which everything happens. And in this universe, everything was in space. All the celestial bodies, including our Earth, interacted with each other in this space as if on a string. All the stars, galaxies, but that's it. Einstein's universe is completely different. As I mentioned, everything moves in a being, not in a vacuum, space. It's not empty. All celestial bodies are moving inside this entity, which you can think of as a dense liquid. And all the planets, all the stars, all the galaxies, according to their size, are bending, stretching, and expanding this space-time. Now let's go back to the single quasar that we see double. It was the interaction of matter in this space-time that caused this interesting situation. And the only explanation for seeing a single object as a double could be this bending of space-time. Since the light emanating from this gigantic quasar falls into another gigantic galaxy or group of galaxies between us and it, the light is bent because these galaxies bend space-time. These galaxies, which can consist of billions of stars, bend space-time in such a way that when we look at it, we see this quasar behind it as a double. This has a name. We call it the gravitational lens effect. It is the bending of light. But this finding is more than an explanation of why we see double, an optical illusion. It is actually a proof of everything Einstein calculated and tried to explain. It is a proof of the general theory of relativity. Because Newton's biggest problem was that even though he could calculate gravity, he couldn't explain how it worked. 
In a way, he said, from now on, it's up to you. He had done some amazing calculations, but that's where he got stuck. He said, you solve it. And what Einstein did was to say, open up, I've got it. And he did, indeed, with the general theory of relativity. What he explained was simply this. The space we call space, the space we think is a void, is actually not a void. It is space. It's actually something that physically exists. Dark matter. And this phenomenon we call space-time is described in its simplest and most general form as in this video. Gravity is actually the bending of space-time by gigantic celestial bodies, which resembles the veil seen in this video and the movement of smaller objects on the resulting curve. So what did Einstein say? Newton, I am so sorry. Again, he was both sad and very happy because Einstein had found that there was no such thing as gravity. Yes, there is. There is no such thing as gravity. Objects were not attracting each other. They were only moving within the limits of the bending created by each other in space-time. You, me, the sun, galaxies. Everything with mass and energy was also creating this distortion. The Kawazalas just now were actually a newly discovered piece of evidence just one of dozens of pieces of evidence. When Einstein came up with this theory, many scientists turned up their noses and called it crazy. And to a certain extent, they were right. Newton had already calculated everything correctly, and our calculations were very consistent. Where did this theory come from? And anyway, no matter what kind of theory you put forward, you need proof, and you can't make anyone believe you without that proof. For this, Einstein would have to wait about four years before everybody turned their heads and looked at him and say, he was right. In 1919, Sir Arthur Eddington, one of the astronomers who believed in Einstein, decided to test the general theory of relativity during a solar eclipse. In this theory, Einstein had calculated exactly how much this bending of space-time would bend light. 1.75 arc seconds. This measurement, a calculation used in astronomy, is simply the angle at which you look at an object in space. Divide one degree by 60 and you get arc minutes and divide that by 60 and you get arc seconds. Einstein had made such a precise calculation and his claim was to be tested for the first time. In order to measure how the light of the Hyades star group, which will be behind the sun during this eclipse, is bent, Sir Arthur Eddington first measured the actual position of this group and then assigned two groups, one in the Gulf of Guinea in Africa and one in Brazil in case of overcast weather, to take measurements again during the eclipse. These groups measure the light from this Hyades group of stars, which is exactly at the back of the sun, during a solar eclipse. By the way, the reason they chose a solar eclipse was that normally you can't get a very clear picture of this group of stars because of the sun. You could only make such a precise measurement when the sun was present, and it was dark enough. After returning to England, Eddington collected the data and found that the light was bent exactly as much as Einstein's theory suggested, with zero deviation. On the morning of the next day, he published this finding, and in one day, Albert Einstein was a household name all over the world, and his name was indelibly etched in history. Now let's talk about something we left unfinished in the previous video, the deviation in the orbit of the planet Mercury. In that video, I deliberately didn't want to give a full explanation because without talking about general relativity, we couldn't understand this deviation that has remained unexplained for centuries. Newton and Kepler before him had tried to explain the orbits of the planets and had made calculations that were incredibly precise for their time. And everything was by the book, except Mercury. 
In the elliptical orbits of the planets, there are sunrise and sunset points, the points where the planets are closest and farthest from the sun. And the orbits of all the planets deviate slightly over time. This is what we call precession. So if all the planets have precession, why was Mercury's precession such a problem? Because there was a very small difference when calculated with Newton's theory. While all the planets fit the calculation exactly, Mercury did not. We talked about it. We said there was another planet or something, but there wasn't. Then, for centuries, all the scientists said, well, that's all right, we calculated it, but there's a small difference, something we don't understand. There's some gravitational magic. We shouldn't tamper with it too much. But Einstein did. Actually, he didn't start directly from Mercury. But when he put forward the theory of general relativity and explained space-time, the pieces would fall into place. When the deviation in Mercury's orbit was recalculated with Einstein's formulas, it fit with zero deviation and error. Because a planet was experiencing this deviation, this motion at the solstice point where it was closest to the Sun, due to the curvature or twist in space-time caused by a gigantic celestial body like the Sun. Wherever you look, whichever galaxy, whichever celestial body you calculate, Einstein's theory of general relativity gives the exact answer, explains all the movements in the universe. But I want to tell you about a very strange event that happened very recently, when the general theory of relativity was caught on camera, an event that would have filled Einstein's eyes had he lived, gravitational waves. Now, if we consider that space is not empty and that every event that happens in the fabric of space-time affects this fabric, for example, a gigantic explosion as a result of the collision or merger of two black holes and an event of this magnitude should affect this fabric, that is, space-time, in a very wide framework, right? Here, think of a drop of water falling into water or you throw a huge rock into the water. With this effect, you will see waves spreading over the water. Einstein predicted these waves, by the way, but he didn't think it was possible to observe them. He was not wrong with the technology of the time, but technology has improved. It has improved a lot. And you know what happened? In 2016, an observatory called LIGO whose main purpose is to detect these gravitational waves, and the scientists who gave life to this project for the first time in history, the incredible energy generated by the merger of two black holes. And when I say incredible energy here, let me put it this way, it could be equal to the energy of all the stars in the observable universe. Gravitational waves caused by gravitational waves. The existence of these waves was theoretically discovered by some scientists in 1974. But this is the first time they have been directly detected with devices, sensors, and lasers. And for these findings, the LIGO team received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017. 100 years ago, people who detected an event that a man had only theorized about received the Nobel Prize. I think this is just one of thousands of reasons to understand what kind of a person this man was, what kind of a genius he was. When you hear and read all this, you think Einstein has finished physics, he has explained everything, he thinks we might fall apart, but everything was just beginning. A very, very different world was waiting for us. The fourth dimension Einstein added would not be enough for us. Five, ten, one thousand countless dimensions. Cats that were both dead and alive. Particles that are in different places at the same time, but in telepathic communication. Erwin Schrödinger, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, Max Planck, Max Born. He was waiting for us, quantum world. He was waiting for us. Don't forget to like the video, 
and subscribe to my channel. Until we meet again, take good care of yourselves, and as always, I'm glad you're here. Love.